Welcome to everyone. I think it's uh, time to start. Um, as far as I know, like there's not much uh, space available for uh, like afterwards, so we should just get up on speed. And like I know that people will come in a little bit more, but uh, it's uh, I think the best way to already settle in. Okay, so. Today I, I would try to explain to you like uh, the idea that we, that we have and actually what is also going on. It's a lot about not what is Bosch or Bosch Software Innovations is doing. I'm an employee of Bosch Software Innovations, so that is a subsidiary of Bosch, but it's not a big Bosch. And yeah, we always have to emphasize it in this context with a C. <laughs> okay, and so just let's, let's just take one step back. What is ahead of us? Like, um, and us, I mean, like, primarily the industrial manufacturers. So software is becoming more and more important, especially now also for all the industrial players. And for example, if you're looking at cars, 90% of the automotive innovations is considered to be part or taking place in the software today. So that is changing a lot of things. It's not saying that like all the other stuff is no longer important. That's still uh, really important. You can see it, everyone who is trying to manufacture things with Six Sigma, meaning you're trying to produce one million pieces and you only have a failure rate of uh, with a one digit. And like putting a sticker the wrong way on the, on, on the piece is already a failure. So you can imagine how, how much that takes to do something like that. And Bosch is doing that a lot. So, but still, software is becoming a really, really crucial factor in everything. And that is like what we are facing in the entire industry. And so it's no wonder that actually also General Electric CEO said, every industrial company will become a software company. And that is a big change. So the interesting thing is, and that is what Mike Milankovic saying that, that every software company is an open source company. Why that? Because actually, when you're looking at it, how many of the components, what the stack that is in the software, more and more in like, especially in the uh, in internet stuff, the percentage of open source software in there is increasing more and more. Meaning, at the end of the day. There's so many products, so many things that are out there that are used one way or the other, where you have 90%, 99% open source software in it. So that's not the case, for example, with every embedded stuff. That's not the case in every domain or industry at the moment. But you can see, looking at the numbers, that actually it's going this way. So there are various reasons for that. And it's always different. But for example, if you're just looking at this, uh, investigation of the price of software from 1980 to like today it is more or less fallen down to something like 0.7 percent of the price at that time <coughs> so if you're looking at what actually is going on it's no longer the software that is sold that much it's more the functionality and services around it more and more everything is becoming something like a service Websites, apps, cloud services. So it's moving away from the actual one single component in an ecosystem or something that you are selling. And then you leave it to the customer to do all the integration and everything and keeping it up to date and whatever. Even like trying to sell like the next version of it a month later or a year later. It's more or less moving towards that you are selling the functionality. Or, for example, in our case, a lot of the hardware that's coming with it. So, it's another important factor is that things are moving from value chains uh, to ecosystems, meaning that you have a huge complex setup. It doesn't work, for example, if you're buying, if you're trying to sell an app in an app store that is not working, that is not has not a, a significant market share. Your app could be the best one. You cannot sell it. So that's the difference, like, for example, to value chains. 
So you need to be in the right ecosystem, and the right ecosystem needs to have like the, um, a big market share, otherwise the entire ecosystem does not work. So it, the dependencies are much more complex, and you have to make sure that everything is working together and fine in a way that, you're, that your business is prospering. There's one problem with these ecosystems. You, could, you can watch that in IT again and again, over and over. Typically, it's the big fish are eating the small fish. And the small fish have a big problem because at the end of the day, you just have, for example, one, two, three, or four solutions, ecosystem or something around a certain technology. So you don't have 100 different app stores for smart homes, uh, for, sorry, for smartphones. You just have like a few ones, a few. And these view are con more or less the thing that you have to, that you have to live with and you have to live into this ecosystem. And so what can small fish do to make sure that actually for them it's working, that they are having good business? They can swarm. And they can build a swarm and they can go for like trying to do the same thing as the big fish. And that's actually what Sim Ramji was talking about with the positive sum game. Just gather together, uh, gather in, in a community and just offer that. So like have this technology in particular and like try to make that prosper. Instead of trying to make your own technology individually prosper, what is exactly then a small fish? And the small fishes will, are eaten in the ecosystem business they're eaten by the big fish. So that is also true, for example, for IoT. And it's interesting how many developers are there to be considered in the year 2020. In 2020, we see the, like the forecast is that there will be 4.5 million developers in the IoT business. So when you want to have something like a platform or like a prospering ecosystem, around IoT, you need to convince these 4.5 million developers that you're on the right, that this is the right technology, or at least a big portion of that. If you're not able to convince like at least something, let's say like 25% of them, it's very likely that your technology will not survive the consolidation of the entire IoT ecosystem fight. So, it is essential to build up an ecosystem around your technology. And this ecosystem around your technology, that is what you have in, in the IT industry with software. You have software, the software is building an ecosystem. The ecosystem is that what, what is like then afterwards making sure or like it's the crucial factor if you're actually making good business or not. And that's the reason why open source is a really interesting and good way to introduce the technology into the market with partners as Cloud Foundry. It's the same idea. Cloud Foundry is providing a technology. This technology is widely used, building an ecosystem. And so you can stand up against vendors that are actually providing one proprietary technology. So where you have something like a vendor lock-in. So the community is actually the capacity. The more people, the more companies you can gather behind your technology, the better it is for your technology, for your ecosystem, and then also for your business. So what does that actually mean for IoT? In IoT, we have the situation that you have a lot of different use cases. For example, we, this is like one of them. Uh, it's 600 euro machine uh, for like on building construction sets lying around and what happens often they are just getting lost. So this is the situation you want to know where are your tools and that's like track, track my tool. That's like a, a typical IoT use case for Bosch. Or you have like something totally different. You have like a garage and you want to know where are the empty parking, uh, where are the, like the available parking spaces. So that's like another thing. You can drive around everywhere or you can just have like a device that is just saying this parking spot is empty. And I could just go on like that for on and on because Bosch is actually producing one million devices per day. 
So we have thousands of these use cases. It's not, I'm not saying that we have IoT services for all these devices at the moment, but the customer the demand is going more and more towards this direction. So this is a crucial thing for us. We have to think about, okay, what devices need to be connected in what way and what services will the customers want to have in the future? And of course, that means we also have to think about how to build this. And so the current situation today is typically that you have one stack for one solution, meaning you have one device, you're building one stack for one solution. And so currently Bosch is much more in the, like all the industrial manufacturers, it's not only Bosch, in the, in the business of producing these devices, but the future is going also into these, uh, into these services. So in the server, between the services and the devices, there's something what we need. We don't care really about that much, but we just need it. And that's the middleware. And it's really hard to always, like for a million devices per day, for hundreds of different use cases, it's really hard to build it always from the, from the scratch. So the idea is, of course, to have something like a generic platform in the middle that just speeds up the development of every kind of solution. The other thing is, it of course would be so great if we could just combine these different devices and the solutions so we can have different category of devices in one IoT service. So that's the other idea behind it. So, and at the end of the day, it would be really great if people would just say, oh, we put everything out of our house that is not coming from one single vendor, Bosch, for example, but typically what happens is they have a lot of different renders. So it also needs to be cross-render. So you need to have, in the future, cross-render and cross-domain platforms for IoT. That is where everyone wants to go, actually. It's not only the idea of us, it's like just out there in the air. Everyone is thinking about this generic IoT platform that everyone can use, every device can be connected, and everyone can write applications on top of that as an IoT solution. That is an obvious solution for this problem. So everyone wants to get in there, like IoT framework vendors, cloud providers, device manufacturers, connectivity providers, internet platform providers, IoT startups, system integrators, IoT solution providers, and I'm sure I forgot other categories of companies that would like to go there. So there are actually two possible ways to do that. One is a closed third-party IoT platform that is more or less than this, of course, vendor of this platform is, as every company, trying to maximize their profits, which would be, in a way, not that good for the people that are trying to de sell devices and they're trying to offer services on top of that because they would be in a bad vendor lock-in because that would mean that this platform will just rule them. And if, if they want to be in that ecosystem business, they have to accept whatever the conditions are for this from this vendor. So that's, for industrial manufacturers, not a good idea. That's not what they want. Because they are actually then uh, harmed on both ways. Because they would like to sell their devices and they would like to sell the services on top of that. And there's this platform in the middle would harm their business a lot. And they also would have just little control and influence. So that's actually the idea. Just do it the other way around. Make sure there is an open technology, an open source technology, if possible, that is just providing this middleware, and then there will be providers of that technology that operate some such a platform, and you can choose between the different vendors or offer, like service providers of this platform. And then, like the different companies in there, industrial manufacturers or service providers, they can actually have influence because they can influence this platform technology and they can also maximize their profit. What, what would mean it's a lot of competition between all layers, between everyone, that's also good for the end customers. So more or less that's just summing up exactly this thing. If you go through it and think through it, you will actually come out that what is needed, it's an open platform was open source. And so we really, it's really great that there is Cloud Foundry out there and we will come to the next part later. So the idea is more or less something like that. You will have a pass layer that's an open IoT cloud platform and 
our vision at least, that's what we came up, is Cloud Foundry is like the, the cloud part. And then you need all the base cloud services. And on top of that, the IoT, the generic, generic IoT stuff, that's Eclipse IoT. Because that's what we see at the moment, the most promising approach. It's a really nice idea, and there are a lot of that's like 26 projects. So I will tell a little bit more about Eclipse IoT. So there, yes, so there's one thing that is uh, really crucial with all these devices is you need to connect them. And connecting them is a huge problem because there are so many different protocols for like f with all the different devices. For example, you have low power devices, you have gateways, you have like wind turbines, you have so many different kinds of devices, industrial devices and all these things. And like companies that produce a lot of different kinds of devices, they have to deal with all these different protocols. So we were actually looking, okay, how many technology do you need to master communication with all these things connecting it to IoT? And the answer we came up is, it would be really great, great if this would just be one. And that's Eclipse Hono. Um, that's actually one of the, new, one of the newest uh, Eclipse IoT projects that started. And the idea behind this is actually have one technology that then where you have a lot of plugins for all the different protocols, but everything that is like shared between them, just working together. So you have, for example, uh, the telemetric data that is going one direction. You also have the command and control flow the other direction. But you also have situations where it's really necessary that you get one message through. Typically with telemetric data, it's not that important. You know, if you lose one temperature information out of one million in an hour, who cares? But if you lose the emergency call of a crashing car, that's bad. So that's one of the reasons why you cannot just have one silver bullet that is fitting it all with the protocols and with the situations. So this technology needs to actually take care of a lot of different things. It's also this asymmetric uh, information flow. The telemetry information is a lot. The command and control flow is just a little. So it's not a simple technology that needs to take care of all these things. And that's just one example for all the problems that are coming with IoT and if you're trying to build it up in a bigger platform. So the goal actually is to have ready to deploy microservices-based IoT cloud platform. And just to give you an example, this is not like the final architecture or anything like that. Everything is just moving. But this is just an idea how, could, how this could be. So this is just like covering the three, like three use cases. When with the different, you, you already see, like you can have their mobile phone or you can have like a gateway or you can connect the device directly. And then you need the different protocols. For example, you have MQTT as a protocol, or Lishan, which is lightweight m to m or on REST interface. All of that is possible. And then afterwards, you, you have these plugins into Hono, and then Hono is uh, in the back end. There's like the, the application, the actual application, or Eclipse Hawkbit, which is a software updating service. That's also an, another Eclipse project. Or track my, to the track my tool application. So there are a lot of, as I said, there are like, I think at the moment, 26 Eclipse IoT projects out there. This is just a, like a list of them, like a short list of them. So we are actually, we started several of them and we are participating in some others. And there's also like some, something new coming up uh, that's Eclipse Kapua. The interesting thing about that is that's coming from Eurotech. They open source the entire IoT cloud backend. It's not based on microservices as far as I know. So the code base has just, just been released. It's not microservices based at the moment, and it's, it is also not, like it has not integrated all the other parts of the Eclipse IT ecosystem, but they are working on it. And so it's really interesting because that is the first backend, complete backend that you, that you can just use for having your IoT solution. And it, it will be really, really interesting, exciting what is coming out of all this. So at the moment, there's a lot going on at Eclipse IT about that stuff. And it's really great that we can be part of it. So this is just a list of the members at the moment. 
but it's continuously growing. And um, so it's, for example, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if, it's, if they're already in here. General Electric, I think, has now also joined here. I will come back to that later. So now, the second part of the solution. I just talked now about the picture up there, the Eclipse IoT layer, that is the generic IoT layer. But of course, this needs to be today in the cloud infrastructure. And for that, I have my expert with me, Wolf Weber, also working with us. And he can tell you a little bit more about that because actually my knowledge is not that deep into that. And I think for you guys here that are also into the technology, you need someone who's, who knows what he's talking about. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the introduction, the very high one. Um, <clears throat> so my name is Rolf. Um, I work as a lead architect in Bosch for our cloud platform. Oh, sorry. Yeah. And I would just like to take you through some of the challenges that we are facing on this platform, which is, was mainly actually based on Cloud Foundry. And to basically give you an idea of the challenges that we are facing within the IoT scope, right? So don't, don't get me wrong on this side. I don't want to do any sort of blaming in the direction of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. I actually want to show you that they are, the foundation is working on solving these challenges. And it's actually more of a, a shout out to us yeah, to get involved into this, to, to solve these challenges together so that we can all profit from these solutions together, basically. That's what I want to bring across here. So the first thing that we are challenged with is, as Stefan was saying, is the protocol side, right? So we've sort of got, a, if you put it into a picture, a massive wave of protocols coming in our direction of the platform with all these devices wanting to talk to us. And we're kind of sitting there and say, whoa, uh, where is this going? And that's what we are seeing within the IoT use case is that it's not sp specific protocols that are coming. That are, so we're talking really protocols on TCP-based and UDP-based sites. So we're not even talking about specifics like MQTT or uh, CoAP as examples. So there's a whole bunch of proprietary stuff also coming in our direction. So we need answers for these sort of challenges. And so if we look at that, one of the answers that the foundation is giving to us in this challenge is the TCP router, which has come out, and which is a very nice, basic, and generic implementation allowing TCP-based traffic into the Elastic Runtime so that we can start looking at TCP traffic and getting this terminated and have applications take up that traffic. But on the other side, we're still missing the UDP support, which is also a very important support for us that we need to challenge and take up this challenge. Um, I was having a chat to uh, a, a guy from the company GrapeUp, who will be giving a talk, I think, this afternoon sometime, that will be talking about a, an implementation that they've done for TCP routing as well, uh, and UDP routing. So I'm very interested in that talk. So also, as information for everybody of you, to maybe join up in that talk as well and see what they're doing to solve this UDP problem, All right? Um, so if we move on to the next challenge that we're facing, which we actually see in combination with the protocol support is the container networking, right? So if we're looking into Cloud Foundry, we are very isolated on the container level, which doesn't allow us to actually build up clusters within runtimes that we use for our applications. So one of the trending runtimes that we are seeing is Vertix, for example, which is being used a lot in the IoT use cases that are running on our platform. And in this sense, so I know that when we're talking about Elastic Runtime, it's more going into the fact of, well, 12-factor apps, no state, get it all out of there. But if we now, that's why I'm saying it's in combination with the first challenge, look at long living TCP connections, for example, where a lot of our U IoT use cases are trying to get into this bi-directional communication with uh, devices, which are a lot based on long living connections. We have, for example, in the use case of a vertex, uh, uh, multiple instances and nodes of a cluster holding these connections. That means we're already in that sense of these connections have state where we need to know which node is holding which connection to which device, uh, which brings us also into messages coming in from the back end, which want to be delivered to the devices, right? There we have to find out where are these connections. So that is state that we have to bring in there. And this is also where the foundation, once again, is bringing an answer with the container networking feature, which I think is going to be a very, very interesting feature. And I really, really hope it's going to be coming in the new future. future. And I think it's not just going to open up any sort of IoT use cases. I think it's also going to open up a whole bunch of other use cases and ideas that you can actually start realizing with the Cloud Foundry system when you start 
being able to build up clusters and container networks to be able to start clustering systems within the Elastic Runtime. So I think that's going to be a very interesting feature coming on that side. Um, and last but not least, we also have the challenge of the services, right? So this is where we're basically seeing two major points within the IoT segment is that the first is the quality of the service, right? Because what we are seeing increasingly with our IoT use cases, there's not much time from pilot to production to evolve a service to be able to carry the load and reach that production grade that's required for all of these millions of devices that everybody's talking about. And when such an IoT use case is started, they kind of explode. Yeah? So there's the massive load almost sim simultaneously coming onto the system as this thing goes live. And that's why these services actually, when they are established and brought up and offered, they, they have to have a grade A production readiness to be able to carry that sort of grade of production and uh, uh, load that's coming. And the other factor is the quantity or the variety of services. So if we look at the Elastic Runtime, the apps that are running there are very reliant on the backing services that we require. And what we are seeing in the IoT use cases is that certain services fit quite nicely for certain use cases, but for others they don't. So we've gone down the road of misusing services. It's not fun. Yeah? So we need a more variety also on the service offering for such use cases. So the one says the one service fits for me better for my use case, but for the other one, the other one says another service fits better. So the variety is actually important. So this is where also the, the foundation on that side is bringing in the answer of BOSH. We call it BOSH because of our company name being Bosch. <clears throat> that brings in confusion a lot of the times. Um, and on this side, we've, we see a great platform for automating such rollouts and management of such services or products that bring these services. And the actual uniqueness on this side is the abstraction to the infrastructure. So you can independently create these so-called BOSH releases that describe your rollout packages independently to what infrastructure you're running on. So this is definitely an answer for us. But we basically would love to see much more Bosch releases to give us the variety of the services coming in there. And most of all, the production grade, that these really bring quality of grade A production systems, right? And with that, I would like to close with a note from Colin Humphreys. The production grade doesn't have to be able to survive through nuclear wars. So we can always keep calm and just make sure that we bring the variety. With that, I'll give you back to Stefan. Thank you, Wolf. <laughs> yeah, so and the, the third part of the solution is actually no one can do it or IIT alone. So as I already like said at several points, Bosch has decided to uh, participate largely into the open source ecosystem. So the two we've chosen is Eclipse IoT. And so you can see, like we started our first own project for a company like Bosch, this is a, a big step. Um, yeah, sometimes in 2014, that was Vorto, uh, Eclipse Vorto. Then we came up with the next one, Eclipse Hawkbit. And because we realized this is an important ecosystem for us, we became a strategic member of the Eclipse Foundation. Another project we started then is Eclipse Hono. Uh, we started that together with Red Hat. So it's also an interesting step for us to start collaborating on a large scale into these ecosystems. So we started that with Red Hat, which is great. Um, and then we know we, there's another project we started just recently, Eclipse Unite. And uh, this will not be the last one for sure. And just this week, uh, we announced to that we've become a member of the Cloud Foundry Foundation. For the moment, just a silver member, but who knows in the future. And um, it's also great that uh, we were able to partner or like have a yeah, partnership with GE, because it seems to be that we have a lot of overlap in the interest and we see it, at least in some parts, the same way. And so it's really great that we were able to establish this partnership with GE in the Eclipse IoT ecosystem. So they also brought their first Eclipse project there, ACS, which we would like to participate as well in. And it's uh, really interesting what is uh, going on there. And it's, uh, it's GE with Predix and Bosch with uh, the Bosch IoT cloud. We both have like a cloud, uh, 
installation that is based on Cloud Foundry and, and in the future, hopefully more on both sides on Eclipse IoT. But that is not all of it. We hope, of course, as I said, you cannot do it alone. And like everyone who is interested in that, we really hope that you will join these approaches. Because you're here, I think you are already like inside the Cloud Foundry ecosystem, so that's great. But if you want to get into the IT stuff in the long run, I hope something like uh, Cloud Foundry will establish. And for me, it looks like at the moment that this will be Eclipse IoT. So I hope you will join there as well. And so what can you actually do in detail? OK, Eclipse IoT, become an Eclipse member. If you're not already, most of the big companies are. If you're not, for the smaller companies, it's not that expensive. Join the working group then and adopt and contribute to Eclipse IT components. And ho let's hope that we will be soon be able to establish a complete platform there. And Cloud Foundry, join the Cloud Foundry IT special interest group. I'm the co-chair there. And it would be really great uh, if you can participate just to making like this IoT use case is more aware for the Cloud Foundry Foundation. So we would get all the problems solved that are in the Cloud Foundry layer. Contribute to the Cloud Foundry core to resolve the IoT issues. Rolf had just pointed out uh, a few of them. There will be more, but I think these are the major showstoppers at the moment. Contribute to the CF integration, the Cloud Foundry integration of the Eclipse IoT stuff. So we would need to have a way to easily deploy that. And also contribute to the uh, Cloud Foundry integration of relevant base services that are needed for that. So, yeah. Let's do this together. I hope we will be successful. Thanks for everyone for listening. If you have any questions, I think we are over time already, but you can just come up and, and ask us. Thanks a lot. <laughs>